you know, the people come, coming from outside, even though the two groups are Armenian. We are talking about an Armenian, Armenian problem here. I'm not talking now about Russians, you know, uh, despising uh, the Armenians or Russian racism towards Armenians. So this phenomenon is, uh, of course, a significant uh, phenomenon, and I believe uh, people living in Southern California, watching the uh, proliferating number of televisions here and so on, uh, or newspapers, know that this newspaper or this TV station has more, that, you know, follows that orientation, is addressing more the concerns of that group, whereas the other one tends to address, you know, the concerns of this group, and so on and so forth. A divide has emerged, and uh, there is a sense also uh, to various degrees of alienation among these uh, newcomers from uh, Armenia. Uh, very clearly, despite the, the certain degree of inter integration among uh, some of them, uh, overall, uh, it's a world that is quite separate, let's say, from that of the Lebanese Armenians or Syrian Armenians and so on. Okay? And now a few conclusions, uh, just to keep in shape. <coughs> the melting down uh, of the Middle Eastern communities and the increasing westernization of, of the non-Soviet diaspora raise serious questions. First, it is a well-known fact that the second generation of immigrants in the West will tend to promptly lose their uh, uh, native language they will tend also to have a kind of negative attitude towards their, uh, the traditional interpretation of their ethnic identity. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, they are good, uh, you know, they tend to get a culture, losing their culture at the very least, even uh, they tend to get assimilated in uh, some uh, cases. The phenomenon of emigration from the Middle East in particular is very significant because when you come to Nice or Los Angeles or uh, the Bay Area in San Francisco, you do not have anymore the barrier of Islam which preserved the Middle Eastern communities. You had the Dajiks, you know, and then you had the, the, the good Armenians and so on, with overall a sense of superiority on the part of the Armenians toward uh, the people who overall will welcomed them, or at least accepted them in their own lands. When the Armenian moves to the West, he certainly doesn't have that sense, a smug sense of superiority towards, uh, let's say, uh, French culture. Not to give you one example. You see what I mean? It's a, it's a different attitude. And they are more open to acculturation, without any doubt, and assimilation to a significant degree within 30 or 40 years. I was astonished to return to Nice again to, to give you just one small example. Uh, last year to that church, and there I met people I had known who were, uh, you know, uh, slightly older than I, but we were both young in the uh, early 70s, and these were emigrants from Armenia. These were some of the Hyrenatards who had returned to France. Okay? At that time, I uh, was unable to speak Armenian, you know, except a few words. And these people came out from Armenia, they were, you know, fluent in Armenian, Eastern Armenia. I saw two of them uh, last summer, and they are unable to speak Armenian. I'm speaking to them in Armenian, they reply in French. Wow. <laughs> okay. That gentleman now must be about, uh, he's older than I, he must be around probably 62 to 65. Okay. And I was astonished, I'm insisting, you know, I'm continuing in Armenian, uh, he keeps going with uh, French. This is just one small example of the effect of living in some Western countries with strong institutions, strong educational system, uh, and uh, strong uh, cultures. Uh, second consequence, the demographic distribution of the Armenian population outside uh, the former Soviet Union, and more generally outside uh, Armenia itself, does not correspond anymore with what is now the disproportionate geographic concentration of Armenian institutions in the Middle East. Okay. There was a time when the Middle East, you know, you could count the schools. I mean, in Lebanon you might have had, I don't know how many dozen schools, in Iran and so on. Okay. Uh, a lot of them have closed 
you know, I had some data about the number of schools that have closed in Lebanon, which gives you a sense about the decline of the overall population, of course. Uh, but uh, when you look at the overall picture, uh, even those schools that are left, those institutions that are there, will not correspond now to the demographic or cultural weight of those communities in relation to the overall picture of the population. If anything, one would wish uh, to have about 20 Armenian schools in Russia, let's say, you know, in view of the size of the population there. Okay? Uh, so this is also a factor uh, to be uh, analyzed in the future. Uh, as they constitute third point, uh, two-fifths of the Armenian population living outside the homeland and face serious socio-economic, legal and political difficulties, the Armenians living in Russia really deserve serious attention if uh, you know, some Armenian organizations uh, had any intention of uh, uh, being very serious, of course, uh, or even the state. Okay. Uh, these are fragmented communities uh, with poor organization, with very uh, low level of institutionalization. And uh, as I told you, the number of Armenians there exceeds the number of Armenians in South America, North America, and the overall uh, all of Europe uh, without uh, any doubt. Okay? Uh, prior, fourth point, prior to the 1990s, it was Soviet Armenia that tended to provide a modicum of help to the diaspora, even during the civil war in Lebanon, for example, you know, despite the ideological divide, you know, Soviet Armenia tended to be the place where some diasporan kids, mostly from Ramgavar or Hanchagian background, could go get a free education and good quality education and so on. Okay. Since the 1990s, of course, it is no more Armenia that provides help for the diaspora, but it has been just uh, the uh, opposite. Uh, the roles, have, there have been a role reversed. Uh, some remarkable achievements uh, have taken place, and I am happy to see here some faces I know, and uh, they shouldn't think that uh, what I will be saying is boot licking. Uh, one of those remarkable achievements was the American University uh, of Armenia, of course. Uh, the other one is uh, the United Armenia Fund. Uh, uh, and uh, these are, uh, to a lesser extent, perhaps the Ayastan All Armenian Fund. So uh, I don't want to go into details. But these were significant pan-Armenian or you know, uh, achievements or specific achievements. Okay. Overall, however, uh, there hasn't been a kind of organic structured relationship between the Armenian uh, new state and the diaspora for a number of uh, reasons. That's not the topic of this uh, lecture today, which has already been quite long. And this lack of organic communication, it, it would be all too easy to compare the relationship between the Armenian diaspora and the Armenian state with the type of structured relationship that exists between the Israeli state and the Israeli and the Jewish diaspora, for example. You know, you cannot compare the, the degree of integration, structuration, uh, process, uh, rational decision making, overall democratic, and so. On. So this is a major, uh, of course, uh, weakness, I believe, for both sides of the issue, both the diaspora and uh, the state. Many of the massive problems that I have mentioned, immigration, decline in birth rates, and so on, have, of course, something to do with the economy and the political system in Armenia. Uh, addressing some of the comments made by the Catholicos of the Cilician Sea, Aram I, who at that time uh, equated immigration from Armenia with a social disaster, President Kocharyan then replied, this was around 2000, I have the date somewhere, he replied, uh, 2002 actually, he replied, uh, the solution is, uh, let me see, oh it's easy, is uh, investment, investment, and more investment. 
there is no doubt that investment uh, might be a solution, uh, you know, uh, it might be helpful to some elements in Armenia in particular.